Greetings ladies and gentlemen, Theo Hikmat here. Friends call me Jason Zelda, singer, songwriter, and Bible teacher. Today, the pre-video of the Bible Archaeology series. Now this series is probably going to take a while to put together as I'm trying to get all the stuff necessary to put together a proper presentation of various different things that have been discovered over time. I'm putting together this series because I'm really wanting people to have faith in the Word of God. This King James Bible. And I want people to understand um, you can believe what this book says. There are many stories in the Bible, talking about a lot of things in the Bible, and there are some people that want to relegate these things to myth and fairy tale. I want to show people that the things that are mentioned in this Bible is actually true. One of the problems that we have, though, is there are times when things are found out there that pertain to the Bible and the news media never covers it. So some people, they only get their information from CNN or MSNBC, ABC News, NBC News, CBS News, NPR, you know, uh, Associated Press, I mean, New York Times, Washington Post. If you're limiting yourself to just those sources, you're never going to learn these things because they have no interest in Bible things. So I wanted to take some time to put together a video dealing with the issue of Bible archaeology. But before I begin, it is very important that I deal with one major issue. Whenever you're dealing with the issue of Bible archaeology, you are inevitably going to run into one guy over and over again. I received a comment from a guy named Chris, and Chris asked this question. Would you please talk about Ron Wyatt? Chris says, an underrated servant of God. Well, Chris, this is your video where I'm going to talk about Ron Wyatt. But sadly, I don't think it's going to turn out quite the way that you planned. People need to know who Ron Wyatt is, and I want to warn people about Ron Wyatt. You see, Ron Wyatt, many people may not know who he is, so let me fill you guys in on who he is, because some of you are too young to know who the guy is. During his day, Ron Wyatt was considered like the Indiana Jones of his day. He had the money, he had the time, he had the resources, he had the connections to be able to travel around the world, and he would use King James Bible as a map because this is the Word of God. This book will tell you where things are located or approximate locations of where things are located. And if you take it seriously, any Christian could have found these things if they simply would have stuck to the King James Bible and not moved on to those so-called modern translations that changes things. They could have found these things too. But during his time, he managed to legitimately find a number of Old Testament Bible archaeology sites confirmed. For instance, the Red Sea crossing where the children of Israel crossed over from Egypt to Saudi Arabia making their way to Israel, the promised land, he found the spot where they crossed by simply following the pathway spelled out in the King James Bible. He managed to find the real Mount Sinai with archaeological evidence and artifacts to prove that this is the real Mount Sinai because the Catholic Church was telling people that Mount Sinai was in Egypt. They even built a monastery in Egypt, and it was a smokescreen. The real Mount Sinai, the King James Bible says, Hagar is Sinai in Arabia, not Egypt. So he went to Arabia following the guidelines that are in here of where the children of Israel went, and he found Mount Sinai, the real Mount Sinai. We'll talk about that in our Mount Sinai video. He also found the lost cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, one of the problems in Christianity is a lot of ministers tend to repeat other ministers' errors when it comes to Bible archaeology. So if a popular preacher out there says something like, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and then buried them under the Dead Sea, then other ministers will tend to pick that up and start preaching it without researching it. And that's one of the things that's happened. Somebody started this rumor that Sodom and Gomorrah was buried under the Dead Sea when God destroyed them. 
but the King James Bible never said that it never said that Ron Wyatt found with evidence both the city of Sodom and the city of Gomorrah exactly where this Bible says they were and the Bible says they were destroyed with fire and brimstone brimstone is sulfur and both of these places have sulfur balls all over the place and if you light them they still burn and they burn hot and they burn with a lot of fumes after all this time they're still active he legitimately found these places now he's also credited with finding Noah's Ark there is a structure a shape on a mountain in the country of Turkey Ron Wyatt says this is Noah's Ark the Turkish government thinks it's Noah's Ark so much that they build a visitor center there now the problem that I have I can't give him a full check mark on Noah's Ark and here's why the King James Bible says the Ark came to rest in the mountains of Ararat now just like when the Catholic Church built a monastery in Egypt calling that Mount Sinai when the Bible actually said Sinai was in Arabia not Egypt many people are not aware that there's actually two areas on earth that are called Mount Ararat there's the place in Turkey and then there's another Mount Ararat located in South Africa now Africa is a continent that is filled with all kinds of animals many different varieties of animals could it be that the ark came to rest at that Mount Ararat until somebody can go there and research it to say yes or no I'm just going to put a question mark next to whether or not he actually found the real Noah's Ark I'm just wanting to be honest now these are the things he's credited with finding with these he had archaeological evidence he had various different artifacts he would find to prove that these are the places so I give credit where credit is due but I have to give condemnation where condemnation is due too so the credit part is done the rest of the video is condemnation because Ron Wyatt did some really bad things in the Christian community and sadly many people in the Christian community are not aware of what Ron did because it's been covered up there's been a smoke screen that has been put up in front of everybody and a lot of people have fallen in love with the smoke screen he's been considered like a, a hero to a lot of people and people don't like having their heroes talked down about or exposed we want to think strong of our heroes and I used to be a guy that liked Ron Wyatt until I realized who the guy was and what the guy was doing when I was young I didn't have many friends just like today and I would spend time in libraries and I was drawn to reading books on UFOs and pyramids and the mysteries of the earth and for some reason I was also drawn to reading Dr. Walter Martin's Kingdom of the Cults I couldn't understand back then why I was drawn to reading this book on the cults but it's a good thing that I did read it when I was a very young man over time I came into the contact with Ron Wyatt's research and the stuff that he had been finding out there and I sort of got on the Ron Wyatt bandwagon because he was presenting himself as a born-again Christian that was going out finding all these places here and there and people like this guy he has this nice personality and he has this this grandfatherly look he had this way of giving his presentations you know he's hard to dislike okay when you look at him he's hard to dislike but you have to understand that back in those days we're talking the 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 80s and the 90s the technology to learn 
on the fly like we have today, where you can just get on the internet and boom, you can learn something just like that. That wasn't available back then. It was really hard to get information about people and about things back then. You had to go like <laughs> libraries, hope there's a book written about them, you know, uh, encyclopedia maybe, word of mouth. Maybe you might be lucky enough to find a, a DVD or something of a guy giving a speech or, or, or doing something, but it was really hard. Maybe a Betamax tape, those of you old enough to remember Betamax tapes, the small ones before VHS, the big tapes came out. Okay, I'm sort of showing my age a little bit. But unless you had something like that, it was really hard to get information that you needed. But now that we're in an information society, it is far easier to find out things quicker. So back then, I was really in the dark about who this guy was and what he was all about. But I did learn that he had a museum in Tennessee, the Wyatt Museum. And I said, you know, I'm going to go to this museum and check it out. I mean, he claimed to find all this stuff. I want to see what the museum's all about. So I went down there, and it's... It was a a redesigned old gas station that was being called a museum. And he had this stuff in there and artifacts and some of the sulfur balls from Sodom and Gomorrah. And they had this really cool looking uh, scale model of what they say the uh, Noah's Ark looked like and all that. And that was all cool and everything. And as I'm leaving out, I was handed some literature and I didn't pay much attention to the literature. I'm thinking, okay, this must be some advertising, whatever. I wasn't paying no attention to it. More time passes. And I had a friend of mine who wanted to go down to the Wyatt Museum. So I went again and I took my buddy. On the way out to museum, I'm handed literature again. When I got in the car, I began to look through it. And when I began to look through the literature that was given to me, that's when I began to realize that something's wrong. Because the literature that I was given in the Wyatt Museum was not saying, for it is by grace ye are saved, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It was not saying that. It was not saying the Lord took the ordinances that were against us and nailed them to his cross. It wasn't saying that. It was not saying there is only one name given unto men by which we must be saved, the name Christ Jesus. It wasn't saying that. You would expect that if this man was a Christian. But instead, what I was given was Ellen G. White Seventh-day Adventist material. And because I was reading The Kingdom of the Cults by Dr. Walter Martin, I was able to identify what it was because it was put together in such a clever way that it was sounding like it's Christianity, but unless you know the buzzwords and the code words that are used by the Adventists, you wouldn't know that it was actually Seventh-day Adventist material. And I began to wonder, wait a minute, is, is Ron Wyatt a plant? Was he sent into the Christian community to pretend to be a Christian? to call himself a born-again Christian, to try to lead Christians to believe that he's a Christian like us, so that once he gets into the fold, he can start drawing people out to start going after Ellen G. White and Seventh-day Adventism. But back then, I didn't have access to the information to find out. But today, I do. Now, for me to sit back and say the man's a Seventh-day Adventist wouldn't hold a lot of weight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let him tell you. This is from the pen of E.G. White. Some of you are familiar with her, some are not. For those of you who are not, in Amos 3.7, the Lord says, or God says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing except he reveal his secrets through his servants, the prophets. Now the Bible is full of prophets, Old Testament, New Testament. For us to assume that God would not send a prophet to guide his remnant church through the last days is to simply not believe his word. Because Malachi 
seven is very clear, and there's another statement made in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 17, it says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, and keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. We know what the commandments are. What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. For the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. So his remnant church are to have keep the commandments and be led by a prophet. And those who are not willing to submit to these facts really have no business pretending to be a member of the remnant church. The church would be better off without them. And they're certainly not doing anything for themselves by being present and stirring up trouble. They're heaping coals of fire upon their own heads. These are things we need to think of seriously. Now I'd like to read what she says that has much to do with what's going on at the present time. So you heard it for yourself. I don't have to say it. He just gave himself away. Now, some of you may say, well, you missed out on some of his discoveries. There's some other things that he discovered out there. I'm going to say this. There are other things that he claimed he discovered. And we're going to deal with that right here. One of his main claims was that he found the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant, for those of you who are not aware, it was a device that Moses was shown by God in heaven. And God told Moses, build this, so Moses did. This device is made of wood, and it's layered in gold. It has, <coughs> it has a lid that is made of wood and also layered in gold. It has angels on the top that are facing each other. The wings go up and outward, and they touch each other. It's all made of gold. It's got four rings, two on the front, two on the back. They're made of gold. It's got these long rods that fit through the rings. They're made of gold. It is an amazing device. And with this device, the enemies of the Jewish people were terrified of this device. It was a very powerful device. Very powerful device. Ron Wyatt claimed that he found this. But unlike the other things that he had found and the other places that he had found, Ron Wyatt never showed any proof that he had found it. But the stories that he told about this began to get more and more and more elaborate as time went on. And people were really being drawn to him because he's saying, don't worry about it. When the time is right, I'm going to bring it out for everybody. When the time is right, I'm going to bring it out and let everybody see it. When the time is right, it's just not right yet. But in the time is right, I'll bring it out. This is the same thing that Jehovah's Witness leadership does to their members with their Armageddon doomsday teaching. They say, guys, Armageddon's right around the corner. It's right around the corner. It's right around the corner. It's right around the corner. It could be any day now. It's right around the corner. It's right around the corner. And they keep their members all hyped up and, and, and nervous over this Armageddon that they've been promising for some 140-something years and it never comes. But their members are always kept on edge over Armageddon. Well, here's Ron White saying, you know, I'm going to release it soon. Just, just relax. Give me some time. I'm going to release it. Let everybody see it at the right time. And he's saying, look, I found all these other places. So just trust me. OK, I found the Ark of the Covenant. So people were willing to give him the benefit of the doubt and trust him. But the story began to get more and more elaborate. He talked about digging a hole in the garden tomb area and going down underground and claiming to find tunnel systems down there and claiming to find a chamber 
that had all kinds of debris and rocks and things in it. And he claimed that there was like this clearance of between 12 to 14 inches from the ceiling to where the debris pile started. And he claims he climbed up there and he's looking down and he claims he found the Ark of the Covenant in this chamber. But along with that, he claimed that he found the blood of Jesus Christ. You look all through the internet and there are people saying, Ron Wyatt discovered the blood of Jesus. 23 chromosomes, man, 23 chromosomes. Where did that story come from? Where did that story come from? That Ron Wyatt supposedly found the blood of Jesus Christ, took it to a lab in Israel, supposedly, and they claimed there was only 23 chromosomes and one Y chromosome. Who came up with that story? I searched high and low to find, to find the name of the Israeli lab that he took this supposed blood sample to. And the best that I could find is Ron Wyatt saying this. Listen very closely. Now then, first of all, in this analysis, I took the blood into a laboratory in Israel. I asked one of the people I work with in, in antiquities, where is a good laboratory that does reliable work? And they said, such and such, such and such. I took it. Okay. Such and such and such and such lab. Where in the world is such and such and such and such lab? I'm going to tell you in a moment where so and so and so and so lab is, and it's going to shock many of you. I'm going to show you where this 23 chromosome and 1Y chromosome nonsense came from. How did he get the sample in the first place? I want you to listen to his claim of how he got the supposed blood sample. Take a listen. As you hear the uh, electric jackhammer, we have been probing around up here with a cross hole. And just immediately to the left of the film container, you see some dark pigmented material. Now this appears to be dried blood, but we do plan to put some of this in the uh, film case and take it back and have it analyzed to see if it is blood. Now this is right under the cutouts where Christ uh, was crucified and near the cross hole that we believe to be the one he was crucified on. There, right at the very tip of the uh, tab, there's some more of this real dark material. As soon as it's exposed to the light, it begins to turn a lighter brown. And this uh, is typical of very old blood. So we'll take some more of this sample here. And it seems to have come down through this area here. As we've collected it all the way along and down into this crevice that communicates with the chamber that the Ark of the Covenant's in. It comes right down through here and down this way and around through a crack right in here and down through this area. Anyway, I have a several samples of it that I have taken. For many years, the specimen sat untouched. Then, in 1996, when Ron was in Great Britain, 
Richard and Elizabeth Reeves and their sons came to Nashville to our home. Richard had a new, unique, and very powerful microscope he wanted to show us. Okay, now you don't have to be an archaeologist to realize what's wrong with the way that the sample was acquired. If you really believe you're handling the blood of Jesus Christ, shouldn't you wear gloves? Rather than contaminating it with your own hands and the hand sweat? You saw that he scraped it right off the palm of his hand into the container, folks. He contaminated the sample himself with his own DNA, his own sweat. There's more. The next question we want to answer is who actually did the test? Ron tries to lead you to believe that this sample was taken to an independent lab in Israel. What lab? A uh, such and such lab? No folks, it wasn't. The reason I know that it wasn't is because they videotaped the actual testing, so-called testing, of the sample. Let's take a look at it and see if we're in a sterile lab. Again, remember, we're dealing with what they're claiming to be the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You would expect that this is going to be done in a sterile lab with proper machinery. But where is the test being done? You're not going to believe it, folks. Let's take a look. Okay, I'm going to take the sample and uh, mix it with sterile water. In a test tube there that we've That would be enough. Okay. And she's going to take some sterile water and uh, a little bit. Just just some drops, all we need, Mary Now and then we. Okay, so now that we've got the sample on the slide, we'll go ahead and focus into the sample and see what comes up on the screen here. And there they are, thousands of living particles, less than a quarter of a micron in size. See? Spores are maybe a half micron, and uh, but most of those little particles that you're looking at are 17,000 x magnified on the screen 17,000 times. You know, in the Bible it tells us that the life is in the blood, and there's little living particles that uh, most people are unaware that are there. This is the same thing we see in living blood. Uh, the scientist in Canada says that these things never die. Uh, the blood may dry up, uh, but these things, he says, they're indestructible, and he says they are the basis of life. The results we obtained in no way can be said to be proof that the specimen was the blood of Christ. You better believe it doesn't. Ladies and gentlemen, Ron Wyatt said the sample was tested in Israel in such and such lab. But you just saw the actual original video of the actual test. Now, they want to tell you that this had 23 chromosomes and a Y chromosome. 
But wait. Who's doing this test? And where is this test being done? Are they in Israel? No. They're in Ron Wyatt's basement. Now, if you actually had the blood of the living God, the blood of the Son of God, supernatural blood, wouldn't you handle it much more delicately than using your bare hands, no protection, in a basement? And this is where the story of 23 chromosomes came from, guys. This is where it came from. A man in his basement. Now, who is the man who was doing this? Does he have a vested interest in making sure that people believe that this is the blood of Jesus, even though it's not? And I'm going to show you the proof that it's not. Who is the man doing the test? Who is this guy? His name is Richard Reeves. Does Richard Reeves have a vested interest in trying to get people to believe that they found the blood of Jesus? Well, it just happened to be that Richard Reeves is Ron Wadd's best friend. He's a Seventh-day Adventist, too. And when Ron Wyatt died, guess who took over? Richard Reeves. The so-called microscope that they're using in Ron Wyatt's basement, according to Mr. Reeves, he custom-built it himself to get the results that he wanted. Take a listen to him admitting it. About six years ago, I learned about these particles as a result of some research that I was conducting, which was totally non-related to archaeology. At that time, I was using a standard medical microscope, and while I could not see these particles, I knew they had to be there. I began to develop my own microscope patterned after the design of Professor Nason's. What you see behind me is that microscope in its latest stage of development. The microscope employs an extremely bright xenon or mercury light source, which can be combined with tungsten light. The light is directed across the microscopic specimen rather than on or through it in what is known as a dark field configuration. The light reflecting off the object is transmitted through the microscope and is magnified over a thousand times. The image is then captured by a sensitive CCD camera and transmitted to a monitor for viewing at screen magnifications of up to 30,000 X. Under these conditions, the tiny living particles can plainly be seen against a dark background. In 1996, my family and I made a trip to Nashville to visit the Wyatts. I brought along the microscope, which at that time was somewhat portable in its early stage of development, and set it up in the basement of the Wyatts' house. One evening, Mary Nell Wyatt asked me to take a look at some material from a burial cave to see if these tiny particles were present. Without my knowledge, one of the samples was actually the blood sample that Ron had taken from the Ark of the Covenant dig. The sample was placed under the microscope, and as the specimen began to come into focus, focus thousands of tiny particles, summitids if you will, became plainly visible. Became plainly visible, huh? Okay, folks, you're seeing it. You're seeing it here. The test was not done in an Israeli lab. It was done by Ron Wyatt's best friend and the heir to the Wyatt fortune, Richard Reeves. Richard Reeves is the same Richard Reeves who gave me the Seventh-day Adventist literature when I went down to the Wyatt Museum. Would you say that he has a vested interest in pushing this story of claiming to find the blood of Jesus? 23 chromosomes and all that, guys? This was not done by an independent lab by professionals. 
This was done by people with their bare hands, no protection whatsoever, no protection to try to stop the contamination of the product, and done in the basement of Ron Wyatt. How much more bias could this test be, rather than having Wyatt do it himself? And you also have to ask the question, um, who was in control of the camera? If Richard Reeves is on the machine and the lady is doing the test, who's behind the camera? Was it Ron? Just a question. Now, I'm going to show you why I say that I know that this is not the real blood of Jesus. It's real simple. All you have to do is catch them in their own lies. So we just heard Richard Reeves say that he's convinced that it's the blood of Jesus. Well, of course he is. He designed his machine to say that. But then he turns around later and says this. Take a listen. In 1989, those excavations were closed, and since that time, there's been a great deal of speculation and controversy surrounding his findings. Controversy that has caused a great deal of anguish with the Garden Tomb Association, for Ron was not able to validate his claims. He passed away in 1999, leaving no conclusive evidence. Wait a minute, Richard Reeves. What did you just say? For Ron was not able to validate his claims. He passed away in 1999, leaving no conclusive evidence. He left no conclusive evidence? And you're the one who claimed that you did the test on the sample and you've been telling everybody that this is the blood of Jesus? Yet in this video you say there's no conclusive evidence. He had no evidence. Come on guys, the gig is up. I know a lot of you want to believe that this story is true. You want to believe it, even though you're seeing the evidence now that it's not true. There was no blood coming down through a crack hitting the Ark of the Covenant. There was no cave underneath finding the Ark by Ron Wyatt. There was no 23 chromosome blood found by Ron Wyatt. The sample, as you saw multiple times, was contaminated multiple times by people touching it with their hands. So anything showing up on the screen that has life most likely came from their hands. You notice they didn't show any pictures of them washing their hands before even touching anything? The fact that he lied and said it was done in Israel by a lab of unknown origin when you actually find out that it was done in his basement by his best friend should tell you all you need to know let me touch on this too the blood of Jesus Christ did not have to go down and hit the ark in order to save us folks you see the Roman soldier didn't stab Jesus until after Jesus had died before Jesus died he uttered three words it is finished. Then he died. He did not say, it'll be finished in a moment when my blood hits the ark. He said it's finished. Then he died. You didn't need the blood to hit the ark. He had already done the work when he died. Now, you do understand that the earthly Ark of the Covenant that Moses had was a replica, correct? He was told to design it the same way that it was in the tabernacle. It's a copy of the one that's in heaven. To put the blood of Jesus Christ on an earthly Ark is useless. The earthly Ark is a replica. You'd have to put it on the original. The original is in heaven, folks. What good is the blood of the Lord on a replica? You got to think it through, guys. You really got to think it through. Ron Wyatt manipulated a lot of people. 
but he couldn't do it alone. This is not just me saying that he lied about this, folks. It's not just me. Let me show you. It's all a story put together by two Seventh-day Adventists working together to push this story. Why? Because it benefits the Seventh-day Adventist church. That's why. When you're dealing with a group like this, it's a group that's all about works, trying to work to please their God, work to please their God, work to please, got to keep them commandments, got to keep them commandments, got to do that Sabbath, got to be in this. They all works, works, works to please their God. That's what they're taught. But they're lying about the blood of Jesus. Is that my words? It's not just my words. Who am I? I tell you guys all the time, I'm a nickel and dime. I'm nobody important. It's not just my words that says they deceive people. I want to hand the ball off to a couple of Adventist guys. One man's name is Colin, a very high-ranking Seventh-day Adventist. He's now passed away. The other guy's name is Denny. Denny was the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist cable network known as the Three Angels Network. I'm going to let Mr. Colin and Denny, the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist cable channel, tell you because I'm a nobody, okay? I'm a born-again Christian. I'm not an Adventist, never will be. But these guys are. Ellen G. White, Seventh-day Adventist, straight down the middle. These are Ron Wyatt's guys. They're going to tell you what Ron did. Was he in it for the money? Did he do this for money? And what did they find out when they went to Israel with Ron. First of all, I want to introduce you to them. Take a look. Good morning. With me this morning is Danny Shelton, the founder, president of Three Angels Broadcasting Network, a network that is taking the everlasting gospel by satellite around the world. It is a pleasure to be talking with you, Danny, today, and we're speaking on a very important topic, the claimed archaeological findings of Ron Wyatt of Nashville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. You have, with your ministry, had first-hand dealings with Ron Wyatt, especially concerning his claims regarding the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. You had a team over there in Jerusalem with the goal of videoing the ark. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to concentrate upon that this morning as we seek to discover whether or not there is any validity in this claim. Because we know that there are thousands of people, Christian people, genuine, sincere Christian people, who believe that the ark of the covenant has actually been discovered. But before we begin... Danny, why not pray for the Holy Spirit to be with us as we conduct this interview? Let's do it. Okay. Ron comes to them with an offer. His offer was this. Remember I told you he was telling everybody, when the time is right, I'm going to reveal it. When the time is right, I'm going to reveal it. When the time is right, I'm going to reveal it. He comes to Mr. Denny the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Cable Network, and tells them, now is the time. He tells them, I want you guys to get the exclusive when I bring the Ark and the Ten Commandments out. I want you to get your cameras. I want you to get the people. I want you to get this whole thing set up and come with me to Israel. 
and I'm going to take you to where the Ark of the Covenant is, and I'm going to have you guys get the exclusive. It was an offer they couldn't refuse, and Ron knew it. So he decided, uh, there's one catch. You're going to have to pay me. You got to pay for this privilege. And the going cost is $10,000 cash, not a check, not a bank transfer, cash. Now we're not talking $10,000 2021 value or 2022 value. We're talking $10,000 in 1989 value which is far more today plus a $40,000 camera was he in it for the money I want you to hear it right from these guys that that's what Ron did Take a listen. Explain how that happened. Uh, I was at a church a number of years ago, uh, well over 10 years ago, Dr. Standish, at uh, Nashville, Tennessee. I think it's probably the Madison Campus Church, and did a, a program there. And afterwards, a man introduced himself as Ron White, and he brought a large picture of uh, Noah's Ark discovery, he said, wanted me to see it, and told me he was an archaeologist, uh, worked actually, I guess, in surgery in Nashville, but was doing archaeology and that he had made a number of discoveries and and uh, just informed me about it uh, I didn't I meet a lot of people thousands of people and so I didn't do anything with this information and came back and probably um, a year later uh, approximately 10 years ago I got a call from um, uh, my attorney uh, Harold Follett and Harold said that he had met uh, a, a man named Ron Wyatt who had told him he had discovered the Ark of the Covenant and uh, Harold had talked to him and wanted me to talk to Ron. And uh, Ron called uh, Lyndon and me at home one night. And um, in fact, on one call, we even had Harold on the phone. Harold's from Oregon. I'm in southern Illinois here. And uh, Ron was in Tennessee, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, we discussed, and he told me a story about discovering the Ark of the Covenant. He told me he went to Jerusalem, that um, there was a cave that he went into and he said when he went into this uh, cave that he found uh, there the Ark of the Covenant, he talked about the blood dripping down over the mercy seat, and he said that the Ark of the Covenant was directly below the cross where Jesus was crucified. So when Jesus' blood uh, came, you know, dripped, it actually went there into the ground, and there right below him, uh, hidden uh, for I'm not sure how many years was, you know, the Ark of the Covenant. And so he said that he would like for uh, Lyndon, me, and our three ABN crew to go over to Jerusalem in a few short weeks he was going, that uh, he uh, told us that he wanted three ABN to get this news to the world. When he brought out the Ark of the Covenant, he wanted three ABN to exclusively give this information to the world. Well, that uh, sounded exciting. Well, it, it, well sure. It's, it's, it still would be exciting if it were to happen. That would be very, very exciting to do it and told us about what he saw in there and said they were going to be digging and uh, he told me that he went through a, a little actually a hole that he dropped down into he said it wasn't very big at all he went down the bottom it opened up and it was maybe a five by five I think uh, opening but he had gone through there I said well why can't you just go back and he said well rock had fallen in and, and kind of closed up that so we're going a different way that's, that's more safe he also said, now I want you to tell no one. No one is aware of this. No one knows about this. Uh, this is so secretive, and I forgot the exact details, but he told me about a man who had been shot and killed right in front of this spot uh, because the Ark of the Covenant, this discovery, of course, is world news, and many people have an interest from many nations in this. And uh, so it's something that he didn't want me to tell my workers or anyone I was involved with. Mm. Well, um what then um, did Ron offer you uh, in, in this dialogue? What Ron uh, told me was, he said, if I could get the um, 3ABN 
crew, if I could get you to come over, uh, I want you to have the exclusivity on this. Uh, he said, I do have a problem in that I need $10,000. He said, I have a machine that detects gold and I need to, uh, uh, to get a new machine, this equipment, and I can't tell you the name of the equipment, but the equipment that I need uh, is going to cost me $10,000. He said, what I'll do is I'll buy this piece of equipment. I'll bring it over, but since I'm not going back and I'm going to be in Jerusalem, I need $10,000 cash because I'm going on to another find somewhere. And so uh, with 3ABN, there's no way I would take 3ABN money on something if I could use the term a gamble like this. Mm -hmm. And so as he told the story, it's very heartwarming. It sounded absolutely marvelous. It sounded wonderful. Uh, I had no reason to doubt. With this. He came through very authentically. Oh, very sure. And I meet lots of people, and if there's one thing you learn over the years, uh, you, you pretty well get a feel for people as to whether they're telling you the truth or not. You can't always know, of course, but Ron came uh, through very, very believable. had no reason to doubt him. Uh, so our attorney talked to one of my board members and said, would you be willing, want to give, be willing to donate $10,000? He told him what was happening the news that would be brought out, how 3ABN would be involved. And the board member said, well, I've lost some money on several occasions with Ron Wyatt that he's promised this or that, but uh, something like this, if there's a chance, it would be worth it. Uh, you know, uh, so he, he did. Uh, he also bought us a camera. We, um, we'd already talked to him about buying a beta cam camera that would be a state-of-the-art at that time. And so we said, you know, would you be interested in, in, is this a good time to get the camera too? And he said, oh, sure, it's not a, not a problem. Uh, you know, let's get the camera. That way, even when we get back, 3ABN can use it because we needed a good remote camera. So he purchased us uh, a camera and also donated the $10,000. So you're talking about a lot of money here. Yeah, that camera was $40,000. Mm. But as I say, he was willing to, to purchase the camera anyway, but this way... It, we had already talked to him, but now he said, I'll, I'll do it now. You wanted the best to take over That's there. right. Sure. Yeah, I can we're understand going to give it that. to ABC, NBC, and CBS. They'll be wanting So you would video. actually have been the exclusive distributor of these That's, uh, that's these what videos. he promised us. He said, I don't want any pay for this, but uh, if you'll give me $10,000, I do need it in cash, but I'll buy this equipment that I need. So you'd be the only ones over there right. uh, videoing. That's right. Is mm -hmm. that the... Sure. No one so, else is to know. Well, Okay, so you just heard it. Now, it was an offer they couldn't refuse because they're all about works, 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 works to please their God. And their main work that they think is going to please their God is keeping them commandments. And Ron is saying, hey, if you give me $10,000 cash, I'll take you over there and show you the real Ten Commandments. They couldn't resist. They couldn't resist. So they gave him the money. They go to Israel and they bring a crew, including Mr. Denny, his lawyer friend named Harold, and a few others. Now, when they get there, Ronnie has his money now. Ron Wyatt has his money. When they got there, they're supposed to get the exclusive. That's what Ron promised them. You just heard him. Ron's got his money and it's cash. Nobody can trace it. What did these Seventh-day Adventist guys find out once they got to the place where Ron said, the ark is down this hole here? What did they find out? Take a look. Now, you went with the team to video this. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you arrived there, were the, you the exclusive videoing team there that Ron had promised to you? There were probably at least four or five other men with cameras, uh, video cameras there. To video the Ark of the Covenant or just, vi just no. videoing other things? To video. They, they were, in fact, uh, for two or three days... When they first started going on to dig, some of the men who were actually in there were taking their little, they were home 
cameras and whatever cameras they had. They were taking them down and taking video, but Ron wouldn't let uh, my brother Ronnie Shelton went with me and Linda, my wife Linda, and for several days he wouldn't even let us go down into the to the hole. It's there in the garden tomb right in Jerusalem. Uh, it's a place called Garden Tomb. All right. That's right. They didn't have an exclusive because there was a whole bunch of other camera people there too. How much did they have to pay for their exclusive? Okay, so they're there. They paid the money. They're expecting to see the Ark. They're expecting to see the commandments. They're expecting to see all this stuff that Ron said is down in that hole. But was Ron showing any interest whatsoever in showing them anything? Is there anything to show? Or was he lying the whole time? Lying to the whole world about him finding the ark. He's got the money. It can't be traced because it's all cash. They can say, we paid you $10,000. I ain't saying, what do you mean $10,000? What are you talking about $10,000? I don't know what you're talking about. Because there's no paper trail. Did he show any interest in showing them anything? Now that he's got the money? Take a listen. When you arrived in Jerusalem, what kind of cooperation did you receive from Ron? Uh, cooperation in the fact that he took us over, showed us where the garden tomb is, said that he wouldn't be able to, um, it wouldn't be able to uh, go go down with these dig diggers for a while. He had recently, if I understood it right, I think his wife, his name, uh, Mary Nell, they had recently married then. They hadn't been married very long. Mm -hmm. And when we got there, he asked Harold. Harold had the money for the 10000 Harold gave him the $10,000. And most of the week we were there, the several days of the digging, uh, Ron himself hardly even went in to beneath. They, he, he and his wife were gone, and I noticed they did. I, I can't tell you what all they did. I noticed they quite a bit of shopping and things like that, so I'm not sure. He didn't show... He did not show an interest in that for a man who said the, the Ark of the Covenant is here, we're going to discover it and bring it out to the world. I, uh, immediately when we're there and I saw the other cameras, I saw the other men, and he had told me the secrecy of all of this and told me the cross holes were there. When I finally did go down after two or three days, I, I asked the men coming up, do you see anything that looks like cross holes? And they said, no, we don't. And I, so I asked Ron, well, where are these cross holes? And he said to me, oh, well, uh, I took people from PTL Club. It used to be Tim, Jim and Tammy Baker's show before yeah. they went down. He said, I, I took PTL. I've been on their show before talking about this, and I brought people over here, and I, I think probably they stole them. And all of a now sudden... Now, wait a minute. Let me get that plain. How do you steal cross holes? You mean that there was wood or metal that was sunk into the ground uh, in a, maybe a squared or rectangular form and the crosses were thrown down into that? Or are you talking about the, the soil itself in which the crosses were? I never, there was nothing there to see. It's like as if I told you today, you know, the, uh, these cross holes were here and you, how would you know or not know? There was nothing there. They're no more likely to be there than they were. You know, I mean, it, there was nothing there. When I asked him, but the things that began to, to all of a sudden add up to me that weren't right is I said, well, wait a minute. You told me not to tell any of my workers, to tell no one. This was the most secretive thing. Now you tell me you've been on PTL and they have thousands and hundreds of thousands of viewers. You've talked about it. You've even had the PTL club over here in this little hole. And, and now you feel that they stole these cross holes. Now, I have no idea what cross holes were made out of. I doubt they had poured cement like we have today. They, you know, whether it was metal or just holes in the ground, um, it, nothing began to add up because suddenly I saw it wasn't secret when the other men were here with cameras. If you found all of that in the chamber underground, and you're just going to leave all the camera people sitting outside while you go do some shopping, you know, a little go out to eat, and you're just ignoring everybody for days. 
Is that really what you would do? These Seventh-day Adventist guys started getting ticked off. Day after day after day's passing and Ron ain't showing them nothing. They're getting ticked off. So Denny's lawyer decides to confront Ron and say, Ron, look, whether you like it or not, we paid you to go down in that hole and see the ark. And whether you like it or not, either you go down there with us or he's going to go down by himself. The lawyer himself, Mr. Harold, will go down there by himself and find out what's down there. What was Ron's reaction when the lawyer for Mr. Denny, who was the leader of the Seventh-day Adventist cable channel, what was Ron Wyatt's reaction when he said, with or without you, I'm going down in the hole? Take a listen. And so when we were there, uh, several days went by. We were getting ready a day or two before we left, and we realized that this man's not interested. They're finding nothing over here. The man that comes up, we then by this time was able to go down, saw nothing there. We're going to end up going home. So we said, I said to him, Ron, why don't you, you're not down here. Well, they're doing it, and only so many people can go anyway. And, you know, it doesn't look like possibly we're going to find it this time. So he said, uh, what I'd like to do is I'll six months or so from now he said maybe i'll come back and we'll dig again and i said well if the ark of the covenant's here he said well i have another trip planned and i said but if we know this is it this is the biggest news you know i mean this is going to be world news uh why wouldn't you spend the day we'll stay a few more extra days i it suddenly began to occur to me he knew that there was no ark of the covenant there and the garden tomb in this cave i've been there in there a number of times now and i go down and ron knew it so our attorney felt very responsible. He had actually raised the 10000 from one of our board members. No, no I, I, I want to get this clear. I understood that by 1982, at least this is what I've read and this is what I've been told by one of his keenest uh, supporters, mm -hmm. that he discovered the Ark of the Covenant in 1982. You were there either 1989 or 1990, yeah. seven mm -hmm. or eight years later. Mm -hmm. If he'd already found it, wouldn't it have been an easy thing for him to take someone down and find or view the ark that he had found? If I, I thought about it over there. If I knew the Ark of the Covenant was here, I can't imagine doing anything else till I found it. There's only a few feet of digging, 30 feet, even the way he went. I mean, that only takes so long. It doesn't take seven or eight years. But what I have found out, he'd taken numbers of other people mm -hmm. besides just us. I think he's done this probably over the years a number of times. And, and I don't know it for a fact, but I, from what I can understand in the picture I get, many people have donated lots of money thinking this was going to happen. And, of course, it didn't. When we went down, Harold Follett said, I'm going to go. You know, I feel responsible. I've got Danny involved, 3ABN. I've got this donor involved. I feel responsible. So he said one night, I'm going to go down in this original hole. And Ron said, you're not going to go in that original hole. And so they were on the street corner uh, there in, in uh, Jerusalem. And when Harold insisted, Ron threatened to, uh, I don't know the right terms, but threatened to hit him. And I actually was in between them, not a place I wanted to be, <laughs> ever liked to be, but I was like trying to stop this and Ron told me if you don't get him away from me, you know, something to the term I'm going to punch his lights out. I, I don't, I couldn't give you the exact words, but that type of phraseology, I'm going to punch his lights out and I'm saying, so why are you so upset? Because we just want to do what you've told us was there and why shouldn't he go see? Well, I have um, interviewed Attorney Follett on the phone. Mm -hmm. And without asking him, he told me much the same story, that he'd been seriously threatened and it almost came to blows. Mm -hmm. Why did Wyatt not want you to go down that hole? Was he afraid for your life? Uh, that's what he said. He said, I'm afraid it's too dangerous. And Harold said, well, basically in so many words, I'm, a, I'm an adult. I've been taking care of myself all these years. I'm responsible. You're not responsible. I want to go down. Uh, we found the truth why he didn't want us to go down because we did get a rope and light and Harold took a little pick. And uh, my brothers and I, we went against Ron's, uh, even though Ron was very upset. And we went on that evening. I remember that it was raining 
and uh, we went over into the garden tomb and went down, and uh, Harold went to the hole. Uh, we let him down very tight fit. He actually had to hold his hands above him in order to get down. When he got very low, we could still talk to him. We had rope under his armpit so we could get him back up. And when he got to the bottom, he said it did open up, just as Ron had said. Uh, there was maybe a little five-by-five five room. The only difference is with flashlight and a, a little pick, it was solid rock all the way around. The hole went nowhere. The cave just stopped. There had never been... N never no passageway leading in any direction. No, solid. You can, and you don't have to be an archaeologist or someone very intelligent to know when you're against solid rock that's oh. been there for thousands of years. Now you told me that the rock had fallen down, or at least Ron had, Ron told, had you. told you that large amount of rock had fallen down into that cave, and that's what made it impassable. Yeah, that, that's what he said. But again, as I've already mentioned, it was solid all the way around. Uh, when we brought Harold up, he said, absolutely is as solid as any rock that you see around here. There's never been an opening. Nothing was ever filled. And so that, of course, was the reason Ron didn't want us to go down. We, we surmised that. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that one out because now, you know, he's been exposed. Uh, and now, um, did you have any equipment to show that there was gold anywhere in the region later someone that uh, that we won't give their names at this point but someone um, in our group uh, went back uh, took someone with him they did have a, a machine that does detect gold they used it around the the dome of the rock they used it w anywhere there was concentrated amounts of gold the machine always would detect the gold they took it to the the the, uh, the uh, to the cave uh, garden tomb and there was nothing, it showed absolutely nothing there. And, of course, we know where the Ark of the Covenant, there'll be much gold there also. Oh, and, of course. And, as, and as I've mentioned already, you know, for, for 17 years, you said he uh, says that he discovered this in 17 years. And for now, between that and, and, you know, these 17 years, it's obvious if something that important was there, uh, he would have found some way to get it out and talk about it. But it's not there. He should be able to show it to you. Uh, I can promise you it's not there. It never has been there. There was nothing there. There was nothing there. All that was there. You remember those pictures that they show of Ron Wyatt down in the hole looking up at the camera? Ron Wyatt down in the hole looking up at the camera and you got that little wood platform in front of it to make it look like it's really important and he's looking up at the camera. Folks, that's all it was, was that little hole. There was no chamber. There was no pathway. There was no tunnels. There was no ark. No Ten Commandments. No blood of Jesus. No cross holes. No original manuscripts, no Goliath sword, nothing. And they just told you that. The Seventh-day Adventist leaders just told you that. But it gets worse. When they came out of that hole and realized that Ron White had been lying to them, they were conscience-stricken. And this man here, Mr. Denny, the Seventh-day Adventist guy, his conscience was eating him alive. Because one of his own, Ron Wyatt, had been going all over the world telling this lie over and over and over and over and over and over. And Mr. Denny and his lawyer knew it was lies. So Mr. Denny decides, you know what, I'm going to confess in front of the camera going to confess what I know that's what this video is his confession I want you to hear his confession ten thousand dollars of the Seventh-day Adventist's money that they thought was going to their worldwide work went into Ron White's pocket who knows where the forty thousand dollars went This man knows, and he's about to tell you this whole story about 
23 chromosomes, one Y chromosome in the blood was a lie. Finding the Ark of the Covenant, a lie. Finding the Ten Commandments by Ron Wyatt, a lie. Meeting four angels down in the chamber, a lie. Finding the original manuscripts in the chamber, a lie. The blood of Jesus Christ coming down the crack and then landing on the Ark of the Covenant. You're going to hear him tell you. He is not a hearsay witness, folks. He's not second hand. He was there. I wasn't. You wasn't. He was. He's telling you and he's going to tell you. This, please, look, look, guys. I was a Ron White fan. Just like you. I was. I liked the guy. I applaud the stuff that he found. But the fact that he lied and lied and lied again. And he lied with tears, fake tears like Jimmy Swaggart. And that he lied to the Christian community claiming he was one of us when he wasn't. And then he brings the blood of my Lord and Savior into his lie so that he could make cash, money, dinero, dibiase, cash for himself. This Seventh Day Adventist man was conscience stricken. And he couldn't take it anymore. And a slight moment of honesty. This Seventh-day Adventist leader, the founder of their cable network, says. There is absolutely no truth. I mean, I'm always amazed. And again, I don't I don't hate Ron White. I don't even really dislike him, to tell you the truth. Um, I dislike what he's doing. I, I realize that he's deceived in my opinion, uh, thousands of people, I believe that there are people that's watching this video that will sit back and realize they've given hundreds if not thousands of dollars uh, to this, this work. And I don't like seeing God's work so, so grossly misrepresented. When you talk about something so, and tears would come in his eyes when he talked about blood dripping down from the cross to the, you know, the mercy seat. I mean, how do you dare make up something? Um, I personally would rather go rob a bank, I guess, than to try to use this type of, of a lie to, to um, get funds from people and to get support from people. Now, I don't know what anybody else would rather do. I'm just telling you about me. Uh, I don't want to use God and to, and to, you know, to do, I don't want to do crooked things anyway as a Christian, but if I were going to, and I'm sorry if that sounds... Uh, bad, but I just, again, I t I, it's the only way I know how to be is just be honest with you and be frank with you, uh, Dr. Standish. That, so again, I don't want people to think I have nothing against him. There's not even a glimpse. This is no effort to get back $10,000. That's long time forgot about. That's over and done with. The truth of it is this whole thing, and I don't use this word very often for people who know me. Now, this is not going to air on 3ABN, but people who know me uh, from 3ABN viewers probably never heard me say this in 4,000 hours of television, but this whole thing is a lie. Uh, I've been there. It's not something someone told me. This ain't Jason Zelda telling you. It's Ron Wyatt's own people telling you. If you believe that the Ark of the Covenant and the blood of Jesus Christ and 23 chromosomes and all that, if you believe that Ron Wyatt found it, these guys are telling you, guys, it was all a lie. It was all a lie. It was all a lie. It was all a lie, a lie, a lie. A lie that Ron Wyatt told all the way to his grave. Why did he lie all the way to his grave? Because when you're in a religion like the Seventh-day Adventist, it's all about works, 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 works. Recruit, 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 recruit. 
and his lie about the blood of Jesus Christ coming down the cross and then down the crack and then onto the ark was being used to recruit people into the Seventh-day Adventist group. And as long as him and Richard Reeves kept this lie alive, people keep getting recruited into the Seventh-day Adventist. So if he took it to his grave, people would say, man, he must have been telling the truth in the group. As far as they're concerned, the ends justify the means. If you bring somebody in by lying, they don't care as long as they get them in. You just heard that Seventh-day Adventist man say he was there. There's nothing in that hole. There is no ark. No Ten Commandments. There's no blood of Jesus. No cross holes. Nothing. It was a pathetic hole and a dead end and a lie that was told and repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated and Ron Wyatt could not have gotten away with this without the help of a lot of Seventh-day Adventist leaders now remember when I said the guy had a slight moment of conscience but it was just a slight one in his righteous indignation, he is rightfully angry that he would bring the blood of Jesus Christ into his scam, Ron Wyatt. But did you catch that Mr. Denny gave a little wink and a nod to Ron? That he's going to let him get away with it. If you didn't catch it, I'm going to play it again. Now this is not going to air on 3ABN. Now this is not going to air on 3ABN. Now this is not going to air on 3ABN. But people who know me uh, from 3ABN viewers probably have never heard me say this in 4,000 hours of television. But this whole thing is a lie. Uh Wait a minute. Let me get this right. You know he lied. You just confessed that he lied. You was there to eyewitness the lie. You know there's no 23 chromosome blood that he found. You know there's no ark that he found. You know there's no Ten Commandments that he found, etc., etc., etc. You know it's a lie. You just got done saying it. And then you're going to turn around and say, well, this is not going to air on the uh, Three Angel Network, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and say that he lied. What he's saying, folks, is... They're going to keep it secret from the Seventh-day Adventist members that Ron Wyatt lied. Why? Why, sir? Who is the bigger deceiver then? Ron Wyatt and Richard Reeves? Or the Seventh-day Adventist leadership who knows this is a lie? And they let it continue. Who's the biggest deceiver? I have a motto. And that motto is the truth should never have to be supported by lies. Ever. You say you have the truth. You just admitted Ron Wyatt lied. He deceived and he manipulated people out of their money. You know he did it. You just said it. And then you're going to say, well, I mean, this is not going to air on the three hundred network. So, you know. so you're going to hide it from your members. And YouTube now is filled with videos posted by Seventh-day Adventists. They don't say they're Seventh-day Adventists. They're teaching your doctrines. We know who they are. I know who they are. Saying Ron Wyatt found the Ark of the Covenant. Ron Wyatt found the Ark of the Covenant. Ron Wyatt found the blood of Jesus Christ. 23 chromosomes, 23 chromosomes, 23 chromosomes. And they're using that to recruit people into your group. I know exactly why you won't tell your members. I know exactly why. Because it's all about the money, ain't it? No wonder you don't care that you lost $10,000 to Ron. You've made much more than that by keeping this lie alive that he found the blood of Jesus when you know he didn't. 
if you have to support your religion by lying to people, then you are no different than the Jehovah's Witness leadership because they do the same thing. The Jehovah's Witnesses are taught two main rules by their leadership. Rule number one, you do not want to bring reproach on Jehovah's name. What does that mean? That means if anything inside the group happens, if it's immoral, if it's illegal, if it's ungodly, you better shut your mouth and don't tell anybody outside the group. You keep it inside the group. Because if you say something to somebody outside the group, that might bring reproach on Jehovah's name, meaning reproach on the leadership of the group. It might cause people not to want to join. So anything bad that happens inside that group, they're told you keep it in the group. If a woman's raped, you better not go to the police. You keep that inside the group. If a child's molested, you better not say it. You got to keep it quiet. You think I'm joking around? What do you think they got banned in Russia for? What do you think they're under investigation in Australia for with the Australian Royal Commission on Child Sexual Abuse? What do you think they're in trouble in Great Britain for when Great Britain found out that there's child molesters by the buku in the Jehovah's Witness group? They've learned, hey, man, if you want to hide from the cops, no problem. Join the Jehovah's Witnesses. It's the last place the police are ever think to look because the Jehovah's Witnesses have this quicker, wicker, wicker, squeaky clean image. They'll never think to look there. The British government discovered that Jehovah's Witnesses have a database of criminals that are in their group and they know who the people are and they refuse to turn them over to the police. And when the British government told them turn over the database to the government, the leaders of the Jehovah's Witnesses in New York told the elders who run the kingdom halls to destroy the documents. And the proof is on your screen. They told them to destroy the documents because they love the lie over the truth. Their second motto is in this book right here, Insight on the Scriptures, a Jehovah's Witness publication. It's written like a dictionary. Under the letter L, you'll have the word lie. I'm going to read it right from here. It says, what's the definition of a lie if you're a Jehovah's Witness? Because it sounds very similar to what the Seventh-day Adventist leadership does. When it comes to this issue of Ron Wyatt supposedly finding the blood of Jesus in the Ark of the Covenant. It says here, lie, the opposite of truth. Lying generally involves saying something false to a person who is entitled to know the truth and doing so with the intent to deceive or injure him or other persons. Not telling the truth to those who are entitled to know the truth? I thought lying was just not telling the truth, period. But no. In the Jehovah's Witness group, you got a qualifier. If they're entitled to know the truth, you can tell them. But if they're not entitled to know the truth, you've been given permission by the leadership to lie. And to make sure their members got the message, they repeat it again at the very near the end of their definition. It says here, while malicious lying is definitely condemned in the Bible, this does not mean that a person is under obligation to divulge truthful information to people who are not entitled to it. So do you know why the Jehovah's Witnesses have this wicked, 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 squeaky clean external image? Because they feel the outside world is not entitled to know about the corruption that's inside the group. So they hide it inside the group. But more and more countries are figuring it out. And they're taking action. And the Jehovah's Witnesses are calling the action that's being taken to try to correct these things. They're calling that persecution. Well, it looks to me like the Seventh-day Adventist leaders do not believe that their members are entitled to know the truth either. Because you sat here and just said Ron Wyatt lied and he deceived and he manipulated people out of their money. And then you turned around and said, this is not going to air on the 3 network. So why did you record it? My King James Bible tells you. Know that your sin will find you out. You're right. It may not air on your Three Angels network. It's too small of a network. It'll air on YouTube for the whole world to see. 
that you guys deceive the world with this lie. I want to thank this gentleman here for providing the video. I was not able to catch his name, but somebody gave him the video and it appears it was a Seventh Day Adventist with a conscience who when they saw this and they saw that the leadership who they trusted was hiding information from them and allowing Seventh Day Adventist members to promote a lie to the whole world while the leadership of the group just rakes in the cash, the money, the dinero, the moolah, the dibiase. Is that what it's all about for you? Obviously it is. Must be. Because the truth obviously doesn't matter. It obviously doesn't matter. So I want to finish off this video by talking to just a couple of groups of people here. If you're a Seventh-day Adventist and you're watching this video because it said Ron Wyatt, I'm not your enemy. I'm not the one hiding stuff from you. It took a born-again Christian who you're told to hate, who you're told has the mark of the beast. It took a born-again Christian who loves Jesus Christ and loves my King James Bible to tell you the truth about what happened. And I backed up everything that I said with documentation. Unlike Ron Wyatt, who claimed that he found the Ark, and he claimed he found the Ten Commandments, and he claimed he found the blood of Jesus, and he claimed he found Goliath's sword, and he claims he found original manuscripts of the Bible, and he claims he's found the furniture of the temple, and he showed no evidence. I want to let you know what this King James Bible says if you're a Seventh-day Adventist. You are not required to have to keep the commandments to please God. It is an insult to God that you would try to keep the commandments and try to show that you're going to earn your way to his favor. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says it is by grace you're saved, not of yourselves. You see, when you're trying to follow the commandments, you're making it of yourselves. You're trying to earn it. God is saying no, no, no. No, he will reject you if you try to earn what he's trying to freely give away to you. You don't have to be under the bondage of thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not. Jesus died on the cross and nailed those ordinances that were against us to his cross. You don't have to be under those old laws anymore. He's offering you grace and forgiveness. All you have to do is come to Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Please. I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Can't one person on this earth live out the Ten Commandments? And you're fooling yourself if you think you can. The Bible says if you break one law, you're guilty of all. In God's eyes, you break one, you're guilty of breaking all ten. So you think you've never broken a law? Let me give you one we've all broken. Jesus said, if a man looketh upon a woman and lusteth after her, he's committed adultery in his heart. Now men, you know and I know because we all do it. When you see a pretty woman, you go, whew, man. And you wonder what it would be like to have her in the bedroom. Don't lie to me. It is in our nature to do this. Jesus said, when you do that, you're committing adultery in your heart. Don't you understand? As humans, we don't have the power to keep that commandment. It is an ordinance that is too much for us to handle. It is an ordinance that's against us. So Jesus took those Ten Commandments. He came down here to this earth. He lived it out in the flesh, committed no sin. And then he took that law and nailed it to the cross with him. And gave us a new testament. 
Now there's something here that I want you guys to see. Ron Wyatt always harps on this verse that says God is not going to break his covenant. And then he focuses on the Old Testament Ten Commandments. What he misses though, because of his lack of the knowledge of the Word of God, is he misses out on Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 31 and 32. This is what it says about God's covenant. Listen very closely. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. Now, what did this say in verse 31? It says, Behold, the day comes, saith the Lord, I will make a new covenant. You see, he didn't have to worry about breaking the old covenant. He fulfilled the old covenant through Jesus Christ. Then gives us a new covenant. And he specifically said here, the new covenant, verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So he's saying the new covenant that he's going to bring to us is not going to be like the Ten Commandments. It's not going to be the Ten Commandments. So God didn't break his covenant. He fulfilled his covenant and then gave us a new covenant. Okay, Ron Wyatt was telling people and teaching people that you must keep the old law, the Ten Commandments. But this is what the Bible says concerning the law, the Ten Commandments. Galatians chapter 2 verse 16 in the King James Bible. It says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law but by the faith of Jesus Christ even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified let me read that again not by the works of the law for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. There's no amount of commandment keeping you're going to keep that's going to make you justified with God and the Bible just told you that. The Bible just told you that. Look it up. Galatians chapter 2 verse 16 is right here on your screen. You see the King James Bible spells out very clearly that anyone who insists on trying to still live by the Old Testament Ten Commandments, the King James Bible says you're under a curse because Jesus already paid for that. Look at what it says here in Galatians chapter 3 verse 10 to verse 12. It says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on the tree. You try to abide by the Old Testament Ten Commandments, the Bible says you are under a curse. Because Jesus already redeemed us from the curse of the law. The Bible calls it a curse. Now you can call me a liar if you want. I'm simply reading you the Word of God. I'm not reading Ellen White. I'm not reading Ron Wyatt. I'm reading the Word of God. And you have a choice. You can choose to listen to Ron Wyatt. You can choose to listen to Ellen White. Or you can choose to obey the Word of God. Let me read this for you again. If you insist on trying to keep the commandments, all you're going to do is make God angry at you. And on Judgment Day, you're not getting in. Because he already told you, if you try to abide by the Old Testament law, then you're under a curse. Because no man can live by the law. Look at what it says here again. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, going all the way down to verse, uh, to verse 14. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed if everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. 
but that no man is justified by the law. Let me say that again. No man is justified by the law in the sight of God. That's what verse 11 says. No man is justified by the law in the sight of God. No man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It doesn't matter how many Ten Commandments you think you're keeping. Verse 11 says, no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. You must come to Jesus Christ and set aside this extra adding of the Ten Commandments or you're cursing yourself. The Bible said it's the curse of the law. You want to still abide by those Old Testament Ten Commandments? You are putting a curse on yourself because you're saying that the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross was not good enough for you. I'm just trying to spell it out because Ron Wyatt and Ellen White and the rest of the SDA leaders are not going to tell you this stuff. But this is what the Bible says, and I just read it for you and put it on the screen for you. The New Testament is not thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. The New Testament is believe on Jesus Christ. Anybody can do it. Rich people can do it. Poor people can do it. Anybody can do it. But nobody can keep the commandments. Because once you break one, you're guilty of breaking them all, and you're guilty. And you can't go back and say, okay, from today forward, I'll keep the commandments. It eh, doesn't work that way. Once you broke it, it's broke. You can't refix it. You have to come to Jesus and get forgiven and then operate by his grace. We're going to sin. We're humans, but he's willing to forgive us if we're willing to come to him and ask him for forgiveness and not try to act like we're all holy and think we're going to keep the commandments. I don't care what day of the week you worship on. My King James Bible tells me don't judge a man based upon new moons or holy days, what we call holidays. Don't judge somebody if they want to celebrate a holiday. The Bible says don't do that. The Bible says don't judge a man based upon Sabbath. You want to worship on a Saturday? Knock yourself out and have fun. You want to worship on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday? Look, worship the Lord any day. Nothing wrong with it. People say, man, Jesus wasn't born December 25th. Man, why are you worshiping? Why, why are you celebrating Christmas? Why? Number one, because the Bible says don't judge a man based upon holidays or holy days. And secondly, any day of the week, if somebody's going to say, you know what, we're going to dedicate a day to Jesus Christ, the whole world dedicate a day to Jesus. I'm not going to say, no, you can't do that. You know why? Because the whole world dedicates a day to the devil called Halloween. Why not give a day to Jesus? Even if it is the wrong day, it's a day. Worship him. Have fun. What's wrong with that? Come on, guys. Jesus came to set us free, not to bind us up. Those old laws bound us up. We couldn't do anything. We can't, we can't live by this. So he came to set us free. He paid the price for us. And there's nothing we can do that can top what he did on that cross. The Seventh-day Adventist religion is not the way to go. Come to Jesus and be free, man. Young lady, you don't need Ellen White. You don't need her. No, no. They throw in your face often that God only speaks, you know, through the prophets and that you have to follow a prophet and so forth. That's one of their selling points for their religion. But what they ignore is this here. It's Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Listen very closely, my Seventh-day Adventist friends. Please listen to what the Word of God says. It says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in times passed unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Let's read this again. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. You see, in the past, he spoke through the prophets. But it says here in verse 2, he hath in these last days, are they saying we're living in the last days now? Is your religion saying we're living in the last days now? Then here's what the word of God says about who God's using in the last days. Is he still using prophets? Or is he using his son? Verse 2, half in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Not by a prophet, by his son. Now, who is the son of God called in the Bible? He's called the word of God. 
What do we call the Word of God? The Bible. The Bible. In times past, he spoke through the prophets. Today, he speaks to his son, the Word of God. So get yourself a King James Bible, read it and study it and learn the ways of God. You don't need the Seventh-day Adventist group. You don't need Ellen White. You don't need Ron Wyatt. You need the Lord Jesus Christ. And to understand that you're not needing to be under some group that claims they have some prophet. God ain't using them. He's using his son. The word of God. Listen to him. Listen to God's word. Get yourself a King James Bible. You cannot go wrong simply reading and obeying God's word and just set aside all the Seventh-day Adventist stuff and read your King James Bible and study your King James Bible. That's the way to go. That's how you'll be pleasing to God. You cannot earn it. You cannot earn it. It's a free gift that God wants to give you. Get his word, the King James Bible, read it and study it and leave this Seventh-day Adventist stuff behind. They're misleading you. Let me, I got I to touch on this because you're taught that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Let me explain real quick. Jesus is not Michael, and here's why. Angels have ranks, and you'll learn that when you read the entire King James Bible. Not these fake modern versions. you got to get the authorized King James Version. Not the one called the New King James. The authorized King James Version. The good old 1611. When you read this all the way through, you'll learn a lot about angels. Angels have ranks. They have ranks. An angel of high rank can override an angel of low rank. An angel of low rank can never override an angel that's higher of rank than him. When Michael was disputing with Satan over the body of Moses, the Bible says, Michael didn't bring a railing accusation against him. Why? Because Michael's rank is archangel. What's Satan's rank in the Bible? What is his rank in the King James Bible? He's called the anointed cherub that covereth. Anointed cherub that covereth is a higher rank than archangel. So Michael didn't have the authority to tell Satan what to do. But when Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and Satan came and tried to tempt him, in my King James Bible, he confronts Satan and says, get thee behind me, Satan. What is he saying? He's saying, know your role. You don't belong in front of me. Get behind me. You're not greater than me. And you don't have the authority to tell me what to do. Jesus could rebuke Satan. Michael couldn't. They're not the same person. He's not Michael. He's God manifest in the flesh. Don't try to reduce him down to a created being. Michael didn't create the universe. Michael didn't die on the cross for your sins. An angel can't die for your sins because angels can't die. You got to think it through, guys. Come to Jesus and ask him to forgive you and leave that Seventh-day Adventist stuff behind. You just got done seeing that the leadership of your group hides stuff from you. And they allow their people to publish stuff on the Internet that's lies when they know it's lies and they won't do nothing about it. They're supporting their so-called truth with pallets of lies. And the only thing a lie can produce is more lies. You don't want that. And I want to end this video with this. Chris, we're going to go full circle. Chris, my friend. I'm sure you didn't know about these things pertaining to Ron, but you know them now. You said you believed he was a mighty man of God. No, my friend. The evidence shows that he was a mighty man of fraud. <laughs>